Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good day, and welcome to all to today's global COVID-19 press conferences out of WHO headquarters in Geneva. My name is Christian Lindmeier, and I'm welcoming you to today's briefing. We have simultaneous interpretation, as always, in the six official languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Spanish, and Russian, plus Portuguese and Hindi available. On the podium today, we have, of course, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, WHO Director General, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director for WHO's Health Emergencies Program, Dr. Maria van Kerkhove, Technical Lead on COVID-19, Dr. Mariangela Simao, Assistant Director General on Access to Medicines and Health Products, Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, Chief Scientist, Dr. Bruce Aylward, Senior Advisor to the Director General and Lead on ACT Accelerator. Dr. Peter Menemberek, WHO Expert on Food Safety and Zoonosis and International Lead of the WHO Convened Global Study of the Origins on SARS-CoV-2. And online, we are joined by Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director for Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals. With this, I hand over for the opening remarks of Dr. Tedros. Thank you, thank you, Christian, and uh, welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Today, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire started vaccinating health workers against COVID-19, becoming the first countries to start vaccination campaigns with doses supplied through COVAX. A further 11 million doses will be delivered this week. Between now and the end of May, 237 million doses of vaccines will be allocated to 142 participating economies and countries in COVAX. Tomorrow, COVAX will publish the first round of allocations covering the majority of economies participating in the COVAX facility. It's encouraging to see health workers in lower income countries starting to be vaccinated. But it's regrettable that this comes almost three months after some of the wealthiest countries started their vaccination campaigns. And it's regrettable that some countries continue to prioritize vaccinating younger, healthier adults at lower risk of disease in their own populations ahead of health workers, and older people elsewhere. Countries are not in a race with each other. This is a common race against the virus. We are not asking countries to put their own people at risk. We are asking all countries to be part of a global effort to suppress the virus everywhere. WHO and our partners in COVAX will continue to work day and night towards our vision of seeing vaccination start in every country within the first 100 days of this year. There are now 40 days left. We can only realize this vision with the support and cooperation of all partners. Even as vaccines continue to roll out, we urge all governments and individuals to remember that vaccines alone will not keep you safe. In the past week, the number of reported cases of COVID-19 increased for the first time in seven weeks. You remember that I reported the virus was on a decline for consecutive six weeks but first time in seven weeks, we have a COVID increase. Reported cases increased in four of WHO's six regions, the Americas, Europe, Southeast Asia, and the Eastern Mediterranean. So where we don't report increases in Africa and Western Pacific. This is disappointing, but not surprising. 
we're working to better understand these increases in transmission. Some of it appears to be due to relaxing of public health measures, continued circulation of variants, and people letting down their guard. Vaccines will help to save lives, but if countries rely solely on vaccines, they are making a mistake. Basic public health measures remain the foundation of the response. For public health authorities, that means testing, contact tracing, isolation, supported quarantine, and quality care. For individuals, it means avoiding crowds, physical distancing, hand hygiene, masks, and ventilation. This is a global crisis that requires a consistent and coordinated global response. And we must remember that for millions of people, COVID-19 is just one threat they face on a daily basis. As I mentioned on Friday, today, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United Nations are hosting a high-level pledging event for Yemen, seeking to raise more than 3.8 billion US dollars for more than 20 million Yemenis in need of urgent humanitarian assistance. More than 5 million people are now at risk of famine. And already, half a million children under five could die from hunger in the coming weeks unless they receive urgent treatment. We thank those donors who have made contributions so far. These contributions must be sustained. We're also concerned about the reported arrest of health workers in Myanmar that could affect the response to COVID-19 and the delivery of other essential health services. And in Ethiopia, the ongoing conflict in the Tigray region has put many health facilities and hospitals out of action. We're deeply concerned about the risk of diseases due to lack of food, clean water, shelter, and access to health care. Finally, today marks Zero Discrimination Day, a day to draw attention to the numerous barriers that stand between people and the health services they need. All over the world, inequality, stigma, and discrimination are, and have always been, drivers of diseases of all kinds. And it's timely to, reminder, to remind our focus on health equality for World Health Day this year with the team of building a fairer, healthier world. Ultimately, health is not just a matter of science and medicine. It's a matter of human rights. Christian, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. We will now open the floor for questions. Let me remind everyone to raise their hand in order to be put in the queue. And also let me remind everyone to please only ask one question. If we have time in the end, which I don't assume, we will happily come back to you. Uh, the first question to Sophie. Uh, no, we don't have her own, sorry. Uh, Simon Ateba from Africa News today. Thank you for taking my question. This is Simon Ateba for Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. Dr. Tedros just mentioned that Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire today became the first two countries in Africa to administer COVID-19 vaccine under COVAX facility. I would like to have a feedback. How is it going? Are there any reason why those two countries were chosen? And what's the next phase of vaccination in Africa after Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire? 
And finally, can you update us on how the vaccination effort are taking place in Tigray region in Ethiopia with all the crisis going on there? Thank you. Thank you, Simon. A uh, couple of too many questions. Let me start with Dr. Swaminathan, chief scientist, please. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Yes, I can start and my colleagues can come in. So we are delighted, uh, as Dr. Tedros just mentioned, that the first vaccination campaigns have started using uh, vaccines supplied through COVAX uh, facility. As you know, the COVAX facility was set up in order to accelerate the development of as many vaccines as possible so that the world has uh, a, a diverse supply of different vaccines uh, to choose from and to suit different conditions and also to ensure that there is access to everyone around the world. So this is just the beginning. And as you heard, we will have increasing delivery of vaccines this coming week. We know that there'll be at least 11 million uh, doses being shipped from the Serum Institute of India to countries, um, not just in Africa, but in other parts of the world as well. We will also have shipments going out from the AstraZeneca facility in South Korea. So, so in the coming weeks, we hope to see more and more people, priority groups, healthcare workers, and other high-risk groups in countries being vaccinated, getting protected. We've seen early data from countries where vaccination campaigns started two months ago, the impact that this is having on reducing hospitalization, reducing death, particularly in the older age groups amongst the vulnerable. We've even seen very encouraging data on reduction in infections among healthcare workers who've received the vaccine. So these are still early days, but the signs are encouraging. The safety profile is encouraging. About 250 million doses have been given worldwide. And um, you know, we're, we're, so far there have been no major safety signals, so that's reassuring as well. And we're getting more vaccines coming through phase three trials, and hopefully we'll get into the COVAX uh, a facility, as you know, the J&J vaccine and the Novavax vaccine both have uh, agreements with the COVAX facility to supply doses. So, of course, we are in a rush, we are in a hurry. We would like even more vaccines to go out so that people can get vaccinated earlier. But I think this week marks the beginning of what we hope, you know, will be uh, uh, the, the start of a, a massive vaccination campaign. And as you can imagine, this is the largest vaccination campaign the world has ever seen. So we should not minimize also the preparations that countries need to make. The fact that adult vaccine programs do not exist in most countries, that uh, health systems really need to gear up and do many things um, to prepare themselves, and not the least of which are training people, making sure the cold chain is there, making sure that the regulatory approvals are in place we also have specific requirements on indemnification and liability that countries need to sign. Um, I, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Simao, to explain why uh, you know, certain countries are in the list. There's, there's a, a, a reason for this. Thank you, Simon, and, and thank you, Dr. Swaminathan, for the explanation. Uh, the, the issue of the why some countries are receiving earlier than others is related to well, two things. One of them is the preparedness, because it's not only we have more than, I think, more than 60 purchase orders already uh, issued by UNICEF and by, by PAHO to, to different countries to, to address the, the needs of different countries. However, some of the countries were, had all the documentation ready beforehand. You know, so they were, they were receiving it, uh, received these two countries received last week, and we have maybe, I think, 11 receiving this week coming up, and uh, in the next two weeks, a, a, a large number coming up. Uh, you know that after the, you have the, the emergency use listing by, by WHO, you also have to have the regulatory authorization at country level, and you also have to have a, what we call a, an identification liability signed by the country that's going to receive the vaccines. And this takes some time. Fortunately, most countries now are up and ready to, to move with the documentation 
implementation, and we should see by the end of March all 142 countries that are part of the COVAX facility eligible for the AstraZeneca vaccines receiving vaccines in the next weeks in coming. Thank you. Dr. Ayla, please. Yeah, I think, uh, Simon, thanks for the question. Um, I, I, you, with your phrasing was interesting, why were certain countries chosen? And in fact, uh, we're not choosing countries. What we're doing is taking countries in the order that they are prepared and the shipment can go. It's as simple as that. Um, so as uh, Mariangela and um, uh, 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 Somya mentioned, we have 15 more countries that will be shipped to this week. 14 of those will be on the African continent. That's at a minimum. And then we have another similar same number that will go out next week. Um, we're hoping to bring a number of those forward. So when you ask about the challenges to getting them out, part of it is in the in-country challenges, but part of it is just getting so much vaccine labeled packaged shipping uh, space and getting them shipped. So it's a massive logistical operation that UNICEF and, uh, and PAHO, uh, the Pan American Health Organization, are managing right now. And you asked a question as well about accessing uh, uh, conflict affected areas. And part of the detailed planning for every single country, every single area involved in the, uh, 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 the rollout of these vaccines is to look at how do we ensure all populations are are, um, are reached everywhere. And indeed, this was even um, a concern of the Security Council last week that passed a resolution ensuring that all countries prioritize all areas. Um, so this is part of what we call the National Deployment and Vaccines, uh, or Vaccines Deployment Plan of each country to make sure all areas can be reached. Um, so with that, hopefully, we've given you a bit of a flavor of uh, the challenges um, at the national level to be prepared, but then at the international level to manage the demand. Thank you very much. And for the second part of the question, we go to Dr. Ryan, please. Um, thanks, uh, uh, Simon. Yeah, the, the situation in, 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 in Tigray, in Ethiopia, remains of grave concern. Uh, there have been disrupted access to, to water, to sanitation, to food, to safe shelter, uh, uh, and to essential health services, including commodities and drugs that are life-saving. There's also been disruption of the COVID-19 intervention. WHO has worked to provide essential supplies to cover 450,000 people. That's less than 10% of the popu population. Uh, for, for three months. Uh, but several health services, including maternal and child health services, have been very, very disrupted, and drug supplies remain critically low. The Ministry of Health is working with health cluster partners to try and, and make that situation better. But many are also living in overcrowded conditions and displacement camps, uh, with the greatest risks of diarrheal disease and other diseases, uh, including, including sexual and gender-based violence. The overall risks of diarrheal disease, malaria, and other uh, important infectious diseases will continue to rise as the population remains in, in these uh, circumstances. Uh, our primary aim as an organization, uh, wherever we work, is to ensure that uh, all uh, people have access to the basic, essential human right of access to uh, uh, basic health care. Um, within uh, this situation um, in Ethiopia, in, in, in Tigray, uh, whether it be in Yemen, whether it be in Syria, whether it be in Libya, Somalia, South Sudan, our primary concern is to ensure the human beings, uh, Ethiopians who uh, live in Tigray, are, are given that basic access. We will work with the, the Ministry of Health, we will work with health cluster partners, uh, and anybody else who can help us to provide better access. Um, uh, to the population there. Uh, so from our perspective, we are very concerned. A number of the factors, uh, particularly the malnutrition status, um, that people already were on, already had issues with malnutrition before, and particularly water and sanitation. This is a recipe for, for epidemics. It's a recipe uh, for uh, malaria, particularly in malnourished children, the risk of malaria and, and, and malnutrition, and those of you who've worked in situations like that know what, a, what terrible and awful bedfellows malnutrition and malaria are. So there are significant growing uh, and extending uh, uh, risks to the health 
of, of people in the, in the region. Um, and uh, we will continue, as I said, to work with our partners in the NGOs and the health cluster. Uh, we currently have staff based in McKelly, and we are completing a, a full survey of all the health facilities um, uh, that we have access to in order to assess the, 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 the absolute functionality of those centres. But safe to say is the majority of health services in the region are disrupted um, and not capable of delivering the essential health care package that is currently life-saving. Thank you all very much. Uh, the next question goes to Jenny Leiravello from DEVIX. Jenny, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, first of all, congratulations on the first deliveries of, of uh, vaccines in the past week. Um, I wanted to talk, I wanted to ask about the use of vaccines as a diplomatic tool. So donations of vaccines are being made to low and middle income countries. I wanted to ask if WHO, as co-lead of COVAX, see this as um, complementing the work of COVAX or undermining the work of COVAX. And also just very quickly, I just want to ask of the 1.3 billion doses targeted for um, COVAX AMC countries for 2021, um, how, how much of those have already been being paid for, knowing that um, purchase is dependent on supply and funding availability. availability. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I think uh, Dr. Elwood, are you? Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, so the on the issue of how much of the doses are paid for, so at this point we still have a financing gap for the COVAX facility of about $3 billion. Now there were very generous contributions you saw announced at the G7 just uh, uh, over 10 days ago, if I remember correctly, which brought um, additional financing. And the important thing there is that that financing will allow us to procure all of the vaccines that we currently have contracted right through the second quarter and into the third quarter. So we still have time to be mobilizing the additional resources that are needed uh, to be able to, uh, to get to the full 1.3 billion doses and even more that we are looking for uh, this year. Um, on the first question about uh, uh, donations, so as uh, you saw back in December, we announced the establishment of a mechanism now for ensuring that countries can donate vaccines through COVAX if they have surplus or additional amounts. There are a number of principles that were outlined, including that those vaccines would have to be have uh, WHO emergency use listing or from a stringent regulatory authority, they would have to have approval um, and a number of other major principles you saw outlined. But the reason we put that in place was to try and further our goal of the most equitable access to vaccines that are possible. And uh, as we're seeing now in the rollout of vaccines around the world, we continue to have a highly inequitable situation. We have uh, nearly a quarter of a billion doses of vaccines have been administered as of today, um, and they've been administered in 104 countries and territories, which mean that almost the same number have not received any vaccines. And for vaccine donations to have the greatest possible impact, if we coordinate them through a mechanism, uh, and there's only one global mechanism, that's the COVAX facility, we're going to have the greatest possible opportunity to ensure that those are equitably uh, allocated. Now, for various reasons, some countries will be doing uh, donations bilaterally, and we continue to be in conversations with them to look at how do we align that with the COVAX facility to ensure, again, the most equitable rollout possible. Um, there's a lot of good intentions still in that regard, but we have not optimized the situation so far. Thank you very much, Dr. Elwood. Next question goes to Bayram Altuk from Anatolu Agency. Bayram, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Christian, uh, for uh, uh, taking my question. And it's, it's very good to uh, hear from you again after a long time. Actually, I have a uh, short question. Um, can you see an end in sight for this pandemic by year's end or it is likely to continue through 2022. So what is WHO's new update on this issue? Thank you. 
Dr. Um, Ryan, please. <clears throat> I think there might be a, a few people with comments uh, to make on this. Um, I, 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 I think um, it will be uh, very premature and I, I think unrealistic to, to think that we're going to finish with this virus by the end of the year. But I think what we can, if we're smart, finish with is the hospitalizations and the deaths and the tragedy associated with this pandemic. So the WHO's singular focus at the moment is to keep transmission as low as possible, to suppress that transmission, which will help uh, prevent the emergence of variants, but will also reduce the number of people who are sick and arrive in hospital, and more importantly, to get as many people as possible vaccinated, particularly those on the front line and those who are vulnerable, so we can take the fear and the, and the tragedy out of the pandemic. Um, the questions remain. Um, I believe we're beginning to see data, important and significant data, that shows that many of the vaccines do appear to impact and adjust the way in which the virus transmits and decrease the risk of individuals being infected or passing on that infection. That is really, really encouraging. And we need to look, obviously, at that data more. We need to see how each vaccine does that, but that is very encouraging. And if the vaccines begin to impact not only on death and not only on hospitalization, but have a significant impact on transmission dynamics and transmission risk, then I believe we will accelerate towards controlling this pandemic. I think we have to separate in our minds uh, the issue of us being in control of the virus and the virus being in control of us. Right now, the virus is very much in control. We've seen some good weeks over the last six weeks. We've seen some good news about the rollout of vaccines. And equally, at the same time, we still uh, this week see the flattening out of that progress and potentially uh, disease increasing in, in, in a number of countries. Uh, and again, we still face a huge challenge in rolling out vaccines equitably and fairly to those who most need them around the world. So um, it's much better to be in the situation we are now than we were 10 weeks ago when we didn't have vaccines moving around, when we had the disease continuing to rise. So we're in a much better position than we were. But nothing is guaranteed. I think, as I say, it would be premature uh, to begin talking about dates. We, we need to look at numbers. We need to focus on what our targets are. We should be targeting uh, getting hospitalizations down to the lowest number possible, targeting getting deaths down to the lowest number possible, targeting getting cases down to the lowest number possible. And when we get to those low numbers, we'll be in control and not the virus. Yeah, just to add to that, so you ask us, you know, we, don't, we won't predict the future, but what we can say is that we've outlined the next 12 months in terms of our strategic preparedness and response plan. And what we've done is we've issued this last Wednesday, uh, it's on our website, we've added an additional pillar to the over global, global plan to suppress transmission, save lives, save livelihoods, and that is vaccination. So it's all of the elements that have been outlined since February 4th, 2020, looking at active case finding, contact tracing, cluster investigation, isolation and clinical care of all cases, supported quarantine of contacts, reducing your individual um, uh, actions to make sure that you keep yourself and your loved ones safe with physical distancing, with hand hygiene, with wearing of masks, with which avoiding crowded spaces, good ventilation, open up your windows, etc. All of that needs to remain in place while we roll out vaccines. We are seeing encouraging trends um, in terms of reduction in incidence, but the last week, if the last week tells us anything, is that this virus will rebound. We, we need to have a stern warning for all of us that this virus will rebound if we let it. And we cannot let it. We've all been in a position previously where we've gotten transmission down to very low numbers, and we cannot allow it to take off again, especially as we have vaccines rolling out and especially as more vaccines are coming online and as COVAX is starting to distribute the vaccine around the world. So what you can do is you could limit your contacts with others. Um, you can limit who you come in contact with outside of your home, outside of your immediate family of the people that you live with. Many countries right now are starting to open up schools again. We need to prioritize the opening up of schools while we keep, while we reduce the possibility of increasing our infection risk. And that means we reduce social mixing with other families. It means we prioritize opening schools while we still sacrifice our social uh, gathering with others. We can continue to do that virtually 
while schools get open. We can make sure that we keep our distance from others. You make sure that you wear a mask with clean hands and that you wear an appropriate mask over your nose and your mouth with a good fit, with good filtration, and that you dispose of that mask appropriately if it's a single-use mask or you clean that mask if it's a fabric mask. Make sure that you avoid crowds, please. Continue to avoid crowds. In the area where we live, we've had a couple of weeks of really beautiful weather, unseasonably warm weather, and we see a lot of people wanting to pretend that it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere, but we still need to reduce our contact with others. This will not allow the virus to spread amongst others. So, and if you're, so if you're a case, you need to isolate. If you're a contact, you need to quarantine. If you are vaccinated, make sure you still follow those measures, those public health and social measures that are in place until we learn more. While we are seeing some good news with the vaccine in terms of reduction in, in hospitalizations and severity <coughs> and potentially in transmission risk, there's still a lot to learn of these vaccines and not everybody has the vaccine. So please continue to, to keep yourself um, safe and keep your loved ones safe. We cannot allow the virus to resurge. Thank you. We also have Dr. Kate O'Brien joining online. Kate, please. Yeah, I just want to add to uh, what Maria was um, was explaining, um, that it, it really is incredibly important at this time when the vaccine is rolling out in, in so many countries that this is not the time to allow transmission to increase. Um, as we uh, are increasing um, viral um, uh, transmission, that puts a risk to the vaccines. And so, especially at this time when vaccines are rolling out and coverage is low, um, is ramping up and is going to continue to ramp up in all countries, beginning with uh, vaccination in, in, uh, in many uh, African countries and other countries that have not started vaccination yet. This is absolutely the time to make sure that transmission does not start to increase. That's the thing where anywhere where the virus is transmitting um, and transmits in ever increasing numbers is going to um, increase the chance that there are changes to the virus that would also put the vaccines at threat. So this is really, really important that as vaccines are rolling out, um, people continue to pay attention and be um, as vigilant as they possibly can be to assure that transmission is as low as it possibly can be. And that gives the, the vaccines their best opportunity for impact as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm looking around the room. Yeah, one more, Dr. Swaminathan, please. Very quick point about, just to add to what Mike was saying, I think the goal of COVAX was to bring an end to the acute phase of the pandemic by the end of 2021. So we know we cannot you know, completely eradicate the virus by the end of the year, but we can reduce hospitalizations, deaths, and severe illness. But we can only do that if people at risk around the world get the vaccine. And at this point of time, they're not. So again, just to remind that that's what COVAX was set up to do. If we can share the vaccines we have equitably to vaccinate the 20% of the population, you know, approximately that are at high risk of getting severe illness and death, we can stop that those bad outcomes from happening. Um, uh, while then we can scale up as production increases, we can then expand the vaccination campaigns to cover healthier, younger adults so that you then you know, really start bringing down transmission. But I think our goal really should be to protect people's lives uh, and do it as quickly as possible by sharing the vaccines that we have today. Thank you all. Next question goes to Laurent Sierra from the Swiss News agency, Laurent, unmute yourself, please. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Uh, thank you for taking my question. A question on the variants that you mentioned at the beginning of the press conference. Uh, in your weekly uh, epidemiological uh, overviews, there, there, there is the number of, the, of countries where we can find the variant. And then there are national breakdowns on the share of the new variants within, among the, the new cases. Uh, do we have a, a broad idea of that share worldwide, of, of the share of the, the, the variants uh, among the new cases? Thank you. So thanks for the question. It's a really great question. Um, our teams are tracking uh, the circulation of different variants of concern and also some variants of interest that have been reported and identified from a number of countries. 
our ability to track these variants of concern really depends on the surveillance that's in the countries and also the uh, genomic sequencing that is taking place in countries. Um, these variants are detected through full genome sequencing, and we know globally, um, while sequencing has increased over the last year, um, and there are more than 600,000 full genome sequences that have been submitted to publicly available database, those sequences are really coming from a handful of countries. Um, WHO is working through our regional offices and our country offices, through our partners around the world, our different laboratory networks, to increase uh, genomic sequencing worldwide. Um, we're linking with different pathogen groups, with different with vet sector, with, with private and public uh, partners, to be able to increase our ability to see where these variants are. Um, and so we're limited in terms of our ability to be able to detect this worldwide. Um, trying to account for this, we are uh, working with partners to see how we can support countries in doing full genome sequencing in the country themselves by either tapping into um, laboratories like our GISRIS network, our Global Inf Influenza Surveillance and Response uh, Network, as well as our SARS-CoV-2 lab network, our polio network, our um, et cetera. Um, and if we can't find that ability in country, we're looking to see how we can support that through a partner lab. And we have mechanisms in place to be able to share samples to do that. So this is something that we are looking, we, we have been working on to increase globally. We will continue to do so. Um, but it is dependent on our ability to do the sequencing. We also issued definitions, working definitions last week of what is a variant of interest and what is a variant of concern, depending on the mutations that are identified and any changes or perceived changes in epidemiology or severity. Um, and so there's a global system that is in place to not only track variants of interest and variants of concern, but also to study them to better understand what potential impacts they have on any uh, diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. So this is a work in progress, and we're making sure that we are taking appropriate steps to improve genomic sequencing, which will improve, which will help not only for SARS-CoV-2, but also for any infectious uh, pathogen worldwide. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. The next question goes to Maria Cardim from Correo Brasiliense. Maria, please unmute yourself. Apparently, she's dropped off. Then we go on to Robin Millard from Agence France Presse. Robin, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tedros, just uh, following on from your opening remarks, a growing number of wealthy nations, among them Israel, the UAE, Britain, the USA, They've now administered first vaccine doses uh, to well beyond just healthcare workers and the extremely vulnerable over 80s. To be completely clear, should those countries now completely stop giving any more first vaccinations and instead give up those doses for poorer countries? Thank you. Let me look around the room and maybe Dr. Aylward. Thank you, Christian. No, that's such an important uh, question, and it's the theme that we've spoken about earlier today and on previous days. Um, our collective goal, everyone's, is to get out of the acute phase of the pandemic as rapidly as possible, to get the pressure off our healthcare systems, to get our societies open and functioning again like normal so we aren't wearing masks and physically distanced, and to get our economies fully functional again as well. The fastest way to do that, the most efficient way to do that, is to ensure we protect our healthcare workers, and we protect our uh, older populations, our people with comorbid conditions, which we've talked about um, uh, multiple times now. That's going to be the fastest way to get out of this uh, epidemic. And our, it's not our recommendations, it's every study, whether an economic uh, analysis of the situation or otherwise, has shown that the best possible return on any country's investment is to ensure that those same populations are protected everywhere. 
Now that's difficult. It's difficult for uh, for leaders in countries that have access to uh, to vaccines and more substantive uh, numbers of vaccines. There's tremendous expectations of populations on those leaders. But um, again, the uh, recommendation of the World Health Organization, our allocation principles, and the principles on which the whole COVAX facility and the response is anchored, is to make sure we roll out these vaccines in the most equitable manner uh, possible. And indeed, when we set up the COVAX facility, what we uh, said in negotiation with all the participants is that we would roll the vaccine out first to up to 3% of the population to cover the healthcare workers, and then an additional proportion right up to 20% of the population to be able to cover uh, um, those at highest risk of severe disease or illness or, or death, as, as Mike laid out. So our, uh, that remains our position, and I think there's more and more evidence of that that is the best way to roll out these products. We can't tell individual countries what to do. We make our recommendations, um, and countries will, uh, we hope, um, come together, as the Director General has been calling for again and again, to make sure we roll these out in the most equitable manner globally. Dr. Simo, please. I'll be very brief, just complementing. Because there are two things at, at hand here. One is the solidarity and the, the understanding that no one is safe until everyone is safe, and, and that, that means that all countries should be vaccinating. And I would say that the second thing that needs to move this agenda, the, the equitable vaccine immunization agenda, is related to self-interest, because it's not enough that you cover your population, because you won't be able to reach enough coverage to to actually close down your country and be free of this disease. On the other hand, by vaccinating the priority groups, you are protecting the health systems and you are averting deaths. And this is what we need across the world. So I, say, I would say it's not only about solidarity, but it's very much about in every country's self-interest to ensure there is more equitable access to vaccines in the world. Thank you very much. And Dr. Swami, another please. Yes, just to add also to doc what Dr. Aylward and Simao just said, so there are scientific reasons why we should do this, because you don't want viruses transmitting and, and mutating and creating new variants in some parts of the world, while other parts of the world people think they're protected, but they may not be if the variants evolve you know, to the extent where they become, uh, the vaccines become ineffective. The second are the moral and ethical arguments, and then there are the economic arguments as well. Um, where it's clear that unless everyone is protected around the world, that economic, global economic recovery cannot start. And there are things countries can do. The high-income countries, they can donate uh, vaccines. They could, after they've finished vaccinating their high-risk groups, you know, provide some proportion of the vaccines they have to the COVAX facility for distribution in other countries. And they could help with scaling up manufacturing and production capacity. There are many... Uh, facilities around the world that are probably capable of manufacturing some of these vaccines. What is needed is technology transfer and transfer of know-how. And if we can move on that, if we can identify those facilities and countries that have spare capacity and the companies which have the technology, for, especially on the new platforms, are able to transfer that, within a few months we can ramp up uh, production uh, to meet the demands of the, of the world. So, so there are many actions that can be taken now, and we should seriously think about moving on on some of those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next question goes to Du Yang from Xinhua Agency. Du Yang, please unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my question is, has the global pandemic reached a turning point with the administration of vaccinations. What are the issues or hidden dangers to be watched out for after the restart of social activities? Thank you. Dr. Van Kerkhoff, please. So I can start with that. I mean, I think the biggest worry that I have is, is a, a relaxation of the individual level measures as we see them roll out, a complacency. Um, I know everyone is, is very excited about the introduction of vaccines and vaccinations as they roll out, and they should be, 
because this scientific achievement of having multiple safe and effective vaccines um, that are capable of reducing hospitalizations, are re capable of reducing uh, severe disease and death is astonishing. But we need to make sure that as these vaccines are rolling out, you keep hearing that not all countries have access to the vaccine. Not all vulnerable populations, not all frontline workers have access to the vaccine yet. It will take time. And so as the time it takes to roll out, we still, as individuals, as government leaders, as leaders in our communities, we need to provide supportive and en enabling environments so that individuals can still carry out these measures. As we open up our societies, as we get schools back online, as some businesses start to open up, we need to ensure that as individuals, we take steps every day that we know what our risk is and we lower our risk. And that is about physical distancing. It's about avoiding crowds. It's about doing the things that we need to do every day to feed our families, to, to put food on the table, and to make sure that we have an income while holding back on some of the things that we want to do. And I know that's very hard, but all of us are in the same position up here as you are as well. If we can stay the course, if we can continue to adhere to the public health and social measures, we can drive transmission down. We can drive transmission down to very, very low levels as we roll out the vaccines while we are making the world safe. And that, for me, is one of the biggest worries that I have. If we look at some of the mobility data, we are seeing some slight ticks up in mobility, which means people are out and about and they're moving around. Um, and while we understand this, because you know some of the transmission is still remaining low, we have to continue to make sure that we do everything we can to limit the number of contacts that we have outside of our home. So for me, it's about staying the course, it's being vigilant, it's being persistent, being determined you know, to do what we can to keep transmission low, keep ourselves safe and our loved ones safe. Right, with this, uh, we come to the next question. I'd like to go to Abdella Hassan from Morocco News, and I think we will need translation here in the room for that. Assalamu alaikum. Good day. Thank you very much for having given me the floor. My question is linked to vaccination. Is it possible to ensure the broadest possible coverage for vaccination? Thank you. Dr. Elwood, please. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yes, absolutely, it's possible to ensure the broadest possible coverage, but only through global cooperation on this. Um, if you look at any of the maps that are widely available on the Internet today, what you see is a very different picture around the world. And it's not the picture that we want to see. It's not the picture that's going to get us out of this pandemic, because we're seeing parts of the world where we've got much uh, better coverage, much more use of the vaccine than other areas. So fundamental to getting to a, um, let's say, an equitable distribution around the world is going to be the success of mechanism like the COVAX uh, facility. In fact, that's the only one which is designed to ensure the equitable rollout so we truly get global coverage. Now, at the beginning, that coverage is going to be low because we're going to be constrained in the amount of vaccines that could be made. As Maria said earlier, it's a miracle that we have these vaccines already, but we have relative limited quantities so it's going to take some time to get to coverage that will cover all of the healthcare workers and then all of the older people at greatest risk etc but um, there is enough vaccine in the world to be rolling it out in a way that could protect the highest risk populations and hopefully get us out of this uh, uh, acute phase of the pandemic as rapidly as possible but it's going to require that commitment to the uh, goal of equitable distribution over time, um, again, Dr. Swaminathan mentioned uh, earlier, there is a lot of work going on now to how can we expand production even further to get to higher levels of coverage around the world, because there won't be enough vaccine to cover everyone this year, but there will be enough, as Mike and others said, to make a big dent in this, uh, in this epidemic. If we use this vaccine smart, right, that's the most important thing. Use it in a smart way. Use your weapon in a way that's going to have the greatest possibility possible impact. 
Thank you very much. And uh, we go for one more question to Esmir Milavic uh, from N1 Bosnia. Esmir, please unmute yourself. Hi, thanks for uh, taking my question. And my question is, in light of what we just um, addressed when it comes to vaccine and everything else, many are discussing COVID passports or COVID certification. What is WHO stand at this point on potential options, how we can uh, manage those um, passport or certifications? Because we see the different um, areas such as European Union and uh, countries are discussing all these options, how to avoid discrimination or having someone left out because of different regulation in a different area or country. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, yes, it, it is uh, an important consideration. Um, uh, in the last uh, emergency committee, the, the meeting, the emergency committee at that time <clears throat> advised against the requirement uh, for certification of vaccination as, a, as a, a requirement for travel, understandably given that vaccines were not widely available. But as we see vaccination become more and more widely available in society, clearly there will need to be considerations around how public health, social measures, individual behaviours can be adapted according to that. But as we do that, we have to keep in mind uh, the, the very important human rights issue. Um, if you don't have access to a vaccine, then should that affect your rights um, as an individual? And there are important uh, ethical and human rights considerations when it, when it comes to that as well. Uh, we have a working group, an internal task force, working with external partners on the, the public health and the policy considerations for our member states when it comes to uh, adapting public health measures in the, in the light of vaccine introduction. Um, and also a group uh, working um, with the um, project on um, the electronic or the e-certification of vaccination. Um, we are looking at, uh, at different options uh, for that, but certainly WHO would be in a position to provide uh, some kind of global clearinghouse uh, and looking at blockchain and other technologies for the provision of uh, private keys and, and other mechanisms by which governments uh, can at some point verify vaccination. Um, uh, status of individuals as they potentially move around the world. But again, taking into account that in the absence of universal access to vaccination, uh, it is, there are serious human rights and ethical issues regarding the application of restrictions on travel on that basis. And again, going back to this idea of getting as many people vaccinated as possible. So um, we will be working <clears throat> with our member states and providing them with advice. Each and every <clears throat> member state as a sovereign duty to its, um, to its own uh, population uh, and makes its own national health policies. We will try in as much as we can to provide uh, advice, recommendations for governments to make proper decisions based on science and evidence and in the context of ethics and human rights being preserved. Uh, and uh, you will see advice uh, coming from WHO in that regard in the, in the coming, uh, days of, uh, uh, coming days and weeks. And just while I have the floor, I can't remember who said it, but we were talking about turning points um, a few minutes ago. I, I, I think uh, uh, someone once said that the turning point is the moment when one uh, is, is the moment of naked acceptance of the tr of the truth. So when we talk about turning points, we need to accept the naked truth that vaccine need to be distributed in an equitable fashion. Uh, if we get that done, then we are at a turning point. Until that is achieved, uh, we haven't turned any corners. Dr. Aylward, please. And just to complement Mike's point, um, you know, I think we all understand the interest and the um, about vaccine passports and the like. But again, to Mike's last point, just to reinforce it, it's it's all about the equitable access, making sure we get these products to the right people. And we do not want to do anything that would create an incentive that all of a sudden people are looking for these vaccines for reasons other than the fact that they're treating people and exposed healthcare workers to people with the disease or their older people or others who are at highest risk of dying from this disease. We want to ensure that those are the people that get vaccinated and anything that might compromise that goal is something that we have to think about very, very carefully. 
Thank you very much both. And now we come for, to probably the last question for Lisa Schnirring from SIDRAP. Lisa, unmute yourself, please. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Just a quick one about Ebola, and I want to thank your African Regional Office for all the updates with cases. I see there's a little uptick in um, Guinea. It increased by six cases or so over the weekend to 15, and I'm just wondering if you have any information on where those are from, if they're from the re more remote area or from cities. Any information you can share would be helpful. Thanks so much. This goes to Dr. Ryan, please. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you, and I think we have Dr. Sose Fal online as well. He may have joined, and Sose can, can supplement. Um, we have, uh, as of uh, uh, yesterday, 17 cases, uh, 13 confirmed, and four probables in, in, in Guinea. Um, and uh, the, the most recent cases are in the Enzakure Gekadu area. They're not outside uh, that area, so the disease uh, remains. Uh, in, in that sense contained uh, in these areas, although uh, surveillance is being ramped up uh, in other areas and in surrounding countries. We now have 20,000 doses of vaccine in country uh, and over um, um, 1,100 gene expert cartridges have arrived for the diagnosis of the disease, including uh, drugs uh, from Regeneron and from INRB in, in Congo for the treatment of cases. Um, we've been beefing up our presence on the ground with national experts and WHO experts. We now have 65 WHO staff uh, on the ground. Um, the, um, I think um, the, the key issue right now is, is getting those contacts and contacts of contacts vaccinated. We've identified approximately 500 contacts and 99% of them are currently tracked and followed. So we're doing well in terms of contact tracing. Uh, and then rolling out vaccination, we have over uh, 1,100 uh, uh, contacts and contacts of contacts vaccinated. And again, uh, our thanks uh, to the leadership of Dr. Sakova and his teams in Guinea and the Ministry of Health teams in Guinea who are driving this response with the, with the support of partners. Our Director of Strategic Health Operations, Dr. Michel uh, Yao, and um, our Regional Emergency Director, Dr. Uh, Salam Gay uh, are on the way to, to the region um, as well to provide uh, further support. Uh, we're deploying uh, uh, more support for uh, risk communication and communication uh, or community engagement activities, including support to the Ministry of Health with uh, socio anthropology uh, and other issues. So the, the response is, 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 is moving. We are concerned about the, the surrounding countries, and we've carried out readiness uh, assessments and they're, uh, in the surrounding countries and, uh, and find that uh, all countries require support in order to increase their preparedness benchmark in order to be ready for any possible introduction. Uh, again, we're deploying um, uh, um, laboratory uh, PCR-based diagnostic capacity to, to all of the surrounding countries and are in the process of finalizing a regional response plan with uh, all of those countries through our African regional office. So uh, yes, the increase in the number of cases is, 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 is concerning. Um, what is good is that we are on the ground and tracing and tracking all of the contacts. It is absolutely important that we have exhaustive investigation of each chain of transmission and um, uh, quality vaccination uh, of contacts and contacts of contacts, uh, as well as maintaining good infection prevention and control uh, in, in surrounding health facilities in all of the surrounding countries, as well as strong community engagement um, practices underpinning the whole response. So we're, we're, we're confident at this point that the governments are very alert. Uh, they're moving. They're investing in, in their own capacities with the support of international partners. Um, but uh, we're not out of the woods yet by, by any means. And we need to remain collectively extremely vigilant uh, for any further chains of transmission to be detected. And I'll just give the floor to Dr. Sose if he has anything to supplement. Yes, indeed. We have Dr. Sose Fall, Assistant Director General uh, for emergency response with us online. Dr. Fall, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Just confirm if you... Um, can you hear me? I have an echo here. It's interrupting, but it's okay. Go ahead, please. 
Okay, just to say that to go expecting to have additional cases, that have been more what we can find any additional cases. And it's good that we are finding alive cases, meaning that the surveillance investigation is working very well. We need to make sure that we don't have secondary cases from these cases because we have detecting them early enough and we identify all contact and vaccinate them in a timely manner. So we expect to see additional cases, but the good thing that is we have, you know, experienced team working with local communities and engaging community leaders like religious leaders, traditional leaders to make sure that the community on the response. So we continue seeing cases, but we are confident that response is well set up, including in neighboring countries. Thank you. And can I just supplement for, for DR Congo and the resurgence of disease in North Kivu that uh, it's currently eight confirmed cases, including uh, four deaths, and we have had no new reported cases uh, since the 22nd of February. Thank you very much. Uh, this, with this, we've come to the end of our briefing. And before I hand over for the final comments to Dr. Tedros, let me just remind everyone we'll be sending out the audio files and uh, Director General's remarks right after the press conference and the full transcript will be posted on WH website tomorrow morning. Um, for any other questions or follow-ups, please contact media inquiries at who.int. Dr. Tedros, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, as I said uh, in my statement, it's very good news that um, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire have started vaccination. Uh, but in our campaign, in WHO's campaign, uh, the target is to start vaccination in all countries within 100 days of this year. And we're left with 40 days. And I hope the world will push to make sure that we achieve uh, this goal of starting vaccination in all countries in the next 40 days. Again, thank you so much to all who have uh, joined us uh, today. And uh, back to you, Christian. Thank you. Nothing more to add. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>